Hey everyone, and welcome to the first ATAR Nodes HSE revision lecture for physics. Um, we'll be releasing a couple of these videos, one on each of the core topics, so space, motors and gens, and ideas to implementation, and then a fourth video going through just general study techniques, um, and basically the, the best tips and tricks to help you smash your final HSE physics exam. Uh, so we'll just quickly be going through the space topic, hopefully in about 15 minutes or less. Obviously, I can't include absolutely everything in this video. That would just be impossible. So I'm just going to try and hit like the difficult stuff, the concepts that you really need to have down pat. Um, we go through all of these in our course notes, which you can buy online at atownotes.com. But um, hopefully this will give you a quick crash course and revision of the, the space topic. So let's get started. So we first start off with the concept of gravitational potential energy. Now, you guys have played with this formula, you've used it, you've answered questions with it time and time again. So basically all I want to talk about now is the negative sign, the sign in front of the gravitational potential energy formula. So it's really important to understand why there's this negative sign here. There are many questions about it, particularly multiple choice. Um, effectively, you have to remember a couple of things when it comes to fields. When you work with a field, when you go in the direction of a field, like dropping a ball, then you lose energy. But if you work against a field, for instance, raising a ball upwards, then you're gaining energy, you're gaining gravitational potential energy. Now, we define a point that's infinitely far away to have a gravitational potential energy of zero. As you work against the field, you're increasing energy. So as you move up, upwards and upwards and upwards towards that point infinitely far away, you're increasing your gravitational potential energy until you reach zero. If you keep going up and then reach zero, you must be negative to start with. So that explains why the negative sign is in front of the potential energy form. Let's move on to some more typically space related stuff, escape velocity. So we put a person up on top of the earth and he's got a ball. He throws the ball, throws the ball a bit harder, throws the ball a bit harder. Eventually he throws the ball so hard that it doesn't land back on Earth. It keeps spiraling all around. This is called orbital velocity. Now, if you throw the ball even harder, this is our orbital velocity, but if you get it even, even harder, then eventually the ball flies away from Earth. That's called the escape velocity. It's important that you know the formulas for these, that you can derive them and that you can use them. So let's first derive the orbital velocity formula. For formula derivations, you just have to think about the physical forces or energies involved in the system. In this particular system, we think about two particular forces, the centripetal force and the gravitational force. Now we know that the centripetal force is the force due to the earth spinning, the ball spinning around the earth. The gravitational force is what's attracting the ball to the earth. And we know they must be equal because they cancel out. Using our formula sheet, we find that we can just set these two values equal to each other, move some stuff around and we get our formula for orbital velocity. It's really important that you either remember this formula or know how to derive it. Note that the r in this equation is the particular radius of the orbit, and so it can change over time um, and will determine your velocity. Now let's look at escape velocity. This time we have to look at energy rather than forces. So here we equate the kinetic energy of the ball with the gravitational potential energy of the ball. Now, when we set those two values equal to each other, we find that we can get out an escape velocity formula. Now, note here R is the radius of the Earth or the particular planet that the ball is escaping from. So just a summary, here are the two formulas. You either need to memorize them or you need to be able to derive them. Um, and of course, feel free to pause, write stuff down like I'm going through quite quickly. Um, but you can watch this video as many times as you want. So now let's take a look at rockets. There's a number of important factors that you need to understand when it comes to rockets. First of all, we look at G-forces. G-forces are, I guess, the thrust force, that additional force that astronauts feel when they are shooting upwards in a rocket or coming back down to Earth. Uh, it's kind of what you feel like when you speed up in a car. We calculate a G-force through the formula that's on the slide. That's A plus G over G. Really important that you can calculate it. As an example, if a rocket's accelerating at 10 meters per second, the g-force experience is going to be 10 plus 9.8 over 9.8, .8, which is approximately 2. So that's a g-force of approximately 2. G-forces can be extremely deadly, um, which is why they're kept as low as possible. So now let's look at launch window. 
There are two key things to keep in mind here, not to groundbreaking direction of the Earth's rotation. You want to shoot the rocket in the same direction as the Earth's rotation to sort of gain that extra speed. Um, and you also want to think about where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun so that when the rocket launches, it can best hit the target planet. When it comes to the launch of rockets, you need to understand it in terms of conservation of momentum. So we know the momentum is mass times velocity, and we know that total momentum must be conserved. So how does that relate to rockets? Well, the initial momentum of the rocket is zero. It's at rest, it's sitting on the ground. So the final momentum also has to be zero. In this case, gas is burnt, and it can only flow downwards. As gas burns, it expands. And there's only one hole, which is in the bottom of the rocket, so the gas flows downwards. That's some sort of mass times the velocity of the gas going downwards. Somewhere there has to be a compensating momentum traveling upwards, and that's the rocket. So as the fuel is burnt moving downwards, the rocket shoots upwards, and that's a principle, or that explains, or is explained by conservation of momentum. Um, additionally, since momentum is mass times velocity, as the mass decreases, the velocity of the rocket must increase because momentum is conserved. When it comes to the specific scientists, it's really important that you have sufficient information to answer a three or a four mark question. This is just an example of Robert Goddard because that's what's in our um, course notes that you can buy online at atownotes.com. But make sure that whatever scientist you've chosen, you have sufficient information to answer a question, have a few dates, have some words. You don't need to understand what the various terms mean, like the gyro control apparatus in this case. You just need to be able to say them. There are two kinds of orbits we're interested in. We're interested in low Earth orbits and geostationary. Now, low Earth orbits are exactly as they sound. They have a lower radial orbit than geostationary orbits. It's a radius of about 1,500 kilometers. They have a shorter or orbital period, a greater orbital velocity. Um, they experience orbital decay, which basically just means that they, there's gas molecules hitting into the satellite, which causes heat to be produced. There's friction between the satellite and the atmosphere. Um, and so the velocity gets slower all the time um, over time, and the satellite eventually comes back down to Earth. Regular satellites um, usually are in low Earth, low Earth orbit. It's cheaper to me to um, put them up there because it's obviously much closer to Earth. Geostationary orbit is much higher up. It's got a radius of about 36,000 kilometers, a longer orbital period, which is in fact 24 hours, and a shorter, lower orbital velocity. Um, there's very little orbital decay because there's very little atmosphere at that height. Um, the idea of geostationary orbits is that they're effectively fixed above a point on Earth because the orbital period is exactly 24 hours. That means that if you look up at any point, the satellite in geostationary orbit will always seem to be at the same point. Uh, it's used for communication and GPS satellites because you can always know where the satellite is relative to the ground. Then we look at Kepler's law, which is a really, really useful formula that you get assessed on very often. It says that the radius of an orbit cubed over the period squared is equal to a constant gm on 4 pi squared. Um, as an example, you can use this equation to find the radius of geostationary orbit. Now, remember always to use your SI units. We'll talk about that in another video. But because the SI unit of time is seconds, we convert 24 hours into seconds, as can be seen on um, the top line of the formula, and we can use that to solve for the radius. Finally, let's look at shuttle re-entry. Um, there are a few things to keep in mind when bringing satellites or rocket ships back into orbit. Um, first of all, the angle needs to be between 5 and 7 degrees. If the angle is greater than 7 degrees, um, then the rocket's coming in way too steep, a lot of heat will be produced, and it'll burn up due to g-forces and the heat that's produced. The astronauts will just die. If it's less than 5 degrees, then the rocket actually skips off the atmosphere. You can imagine it like skipping a stone off water. The atmosphere has some density, even though that density is much lower than water, and so the rocket can literally skip off back into space. Heat shields do exactly what they sound like. Uh, they absorb and direct away the heat developed through kinetic energy um, converting into heat energy. There's an ionization blackout, which is kind of cool. Um, basically, all of that heat causes um, ionization of the atmosphere around it, which stops radio waves from entering the rocket ship. So it's really important to have mechanisms in place to remedy this. Basically, because if the astronaut passes out and no one can communicate with the ship, 
then the ship won't know what to do itself for about 16 minutes, which has potentially catastrophic um, outcomes to the person on the ship. Um, yep, and you can use parachutes to slow the rocket down, and you have to always ensure that the astronaut is facing the direction of the acceleration, um, as this basically means that the eyes of the astronaut don't pop out of their heads. Uh, in terms of the slingshot effect, it's just important that you know that you can use um, a planet's momentum to change the direction of a rocket without using fuel. Basically, the rocket sort of um, draws on the gravitational field of the planet that it is slingshotting around. And by conservation momentum, the planet actually loses a tiny bit of the momentum that it has, but the rocket ship gains a huge amount of momentum because the planet is so big that a small loss in momentum of the planet results in a big loss um, gain in momentum of the rocket ship. Here's a just quick example. You can sit down and pause it and have a look yourself, but it just goes to show that a small change in the planet's momentum will result in a huge increase in the rocket ship's momentum. Buzzwords for conservation of momentum and slingshot effect. Questions are conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, and just writing down the formulas. Okay, let's look at the, the special relativity section of the curriculum. And we start with the ether. So back when we weren't sure how light works, um, we assumed it was a wave, and other waves, like water, um, travel through a medium. And water waves obviously travel through water, sound waves travel through the air. Um, since light was thought to be a wave, uh, it was expected that there was some sort of medium that permeates space, and this was called the ether. The Michelson-Morley experiment is a seriously, seriously important experiment. You need to be able to draw it exactly as is on the slide here, um, because drawing it saves you a lot of time explaining it in an exam situation. Basically, it would be used to test whether the Earth is traveling through the ether field, because it would have expected that the light rays would change speed and therefore interact destructively with each other when they recombine um, at the half silvered mirror in, mirror in the center. Now, if the speed was exactly the same, and so if the waves were not slowed down, then the light would interact constructively. It was found that there was no destructive interference, which is known as a null result. Basically, there was no evidence that the ether wind did exist. Now, it doesn't disprove the ether wind, but there was no evidence that the ether wind did exist. So then Einstein comes along, and he comes up with his, his principles of special relativity. There are two. Firstly, that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frame, and that each frame is equally valid. Secondly, that the speed of light is constant. Let's quickly remind ourselves what an inertial frame is. It's any frame moving at a constant velocity. Within that frame, there's no experiment that can determine the velocity of the frame, or even whether it's moving at all, unless you compare it to some sort of outside frame. Okay, let's apply this to special relativity. So we've got a person standing in a carriage um, and sitting still. There's a mirror on the other end of the carriage, and naturally the person has a laser gun. They fire the laser gun, it travels some distance d, it's moving at the speed of light, so using velocity as distance over time, we can say that the time taken for the light to travel that length is the distance over the speed of light c. Cool, not too tricky. Now let's say that the train is moving at a constant velocity. Well, we've already say, said that in an inertial frame, there's no experiment you can do to tell that you're moving at any sort of velocity. So the result here has to be exactly the same, right? The time taken for the light, according to the person on the carriage, um, the time can't change. So the time is still d over c. This is in the passenger's frame of reference. Now let's do the same thing, but in an observer's frame of reference. The observer's um, on the, off the trolley, the trolley's moving along, and the observer's looking and watching what happens. So the laser gets shot, and it moves, but the trolley moves as well. And it keeps moving, it keeps moving, it keeps moving, until eventually the light hits the mirror. Now to the observer, there's all this extra distance that has been travelled. Call that k. And if you quickly do the velocity's distance over time, you find that the time taken according to the observer is greater than the time taken according to the person, the passenger, the person on the train. Basically, it means that time in the two frames of references are different. But we've already said that there's no like preferred frame, um, frame, both frames are right. That just goes to show that the principle of relativity states that time and therefore everything else is relative. 
We have evidence for the principles of special relativity. First of all, atomic clocks. These are perfectly tuned clocks. Um, one's placed on Earth, one's put in a jet. The jet flies around the Earth a couple of times, comes back. They compare the clocks, and it's clear that the one that has traveled faster has experienced less time. Muons. Muons are a particle that have a very, very short lifetime, and so we know how many should reach Earth. But in fact, we find that many more do reach Earth, and this is because they're traveling so fast that they experience less time. So those are just some points of evidence that special relativity really is true. Now, a question we get a lot is when we're using our special relativity formulas, how do you know where to plug your values in? How do you know if it's T naught or T velocity? Rather than just remembering which is which, I usually think about whether the number that we're looking for should get bigger or smaller. Basically, the formula always has something to do with root 1 minus v squared on c squared. We know that value is always going to be less than 1. So if you multiply by a number that's less than 1, it's going to get smaller. If you divide by a number that's less than 1, it's going to get bigger. So in this particular question, we know that the lifetime of the particle will be greater when it's traveling very quickly. So the lifetime will be shorter when it's stationary in the lab. So we want to multiply it by the number that's less than 1. We want to multiply it by root 1 minus v squared on c squared. So that's what we do. So then we find that the answer is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 8. And that is the end of the space video. We've gone just over 15 minutes. I'm sorry about that. But hopefully that's given you a quick overview of all the really important information. As I've said, you won't. that's not everything. There's definitely much more in the space topic. But um, that is a, a decent proportion and definitely covers a, a, the majority of the, the space curriculum. Um, if you want more details, we do sell full course notes on the a Notes website. You can always ask us questions at atonnotes.com, um, and there will be more videos to come for space and many, many other subjects. Thanks.